Okay, this is the third and final part. Thank goodness. Um, almost done. Just uh, two more things to do. Um, let's tackle the first one, uh, the easiest one first, and we'll save the, uh, the toughest one for last. So the only thing left to do besides getting the, the numbers um, to show up on our grid um, where we need to provide the clues uh, to correspond to is the open puzzle piece of this. So I'm just going to double click on that guy. And um, we'll go ahead and get to work here. So the nice thing um, about uh, you know C Sharp, Visual Studio, whatever, is we don't have to recreate these these dialog boxes, right? So I'm gonna do open file dialog is an open file log file dialog box. I'll call it OFD equals new open file file dialog. I can't say that. Um, what I'm gonna also also do is basically add a filter. Filter. Um, and the way this works is, I mean, you don't have to put a filter on here, but if you put a, don't put a filter on here, the user will be able to open any uh, file type or select any file type that they want. Um, and I don't want to give them that capability because, uh, you know, they could open, try and open anything and it could cause the application to bomb. Um, so if you use something other than PZL files like I did, um, then you would need to deviate here to match that. But basically what you're going to do here is you're going to say, this is the, the name of the file that I, or the kind of file that I want the user to be able to open. And then you're going to provide the extension, right? PZO, I think is what I had. Um, cool. And then what we're going to do is we're basically going to say, if the user clicks a file and clicks OK, then we want to do some things. If they don't, then we're not going to do anything, right? We're just going to leave the board as it is. So if OFD dot, uh, what do I want to say, uh, show dialog, which remember show dialog forces the user to address the, the dialog box before allowing them to do anything else within the application. Um, and and when you, uh, that method actually returns a dialog result. So we could say dot equals uh, dialog result dot OK. So if that if those two things equal, then what we want to do is basically a couple things, right? We want to clear the the board, we want to clear the clues, we want to reset our list of identity uh, or ID cells, um, and then we want to build the word list again according to the new file, and we want to initialize the puzzle one more time, right? So easy enough. So we're gonna say board.rows.clear. We're going to say, uh, what did we call our clues? It was a clue window. Clue window dot clue table dot rows dot clear. Um, and then we want to say IDC, which is our list of identity cells. We want to clear that as well. Um, once we do those things, then we want to build our word list again. And then we want to initialize the board again. All right. All right, and I'll just show you. Uh, so puzzle one, this is what we load by default. Um, puzzle two looks like this. Now, what we want to do uh, that we left off here is when they click OK, we want to overwrite the puzzle file uh, variable, right? Because by default, puzzle file just is hard coded the way we did this to puzzle one. But but if the user selects a different puzzle file, then we want to um, you know, use that instead. So puzzle file equals OFD dot file name. All right. Then we'll clear the, the all the boards, we'll clear the list, we'll build the word list again using this new file name, and then we'll initialize the board. So let's try and see what we get. Now, again, puzzle one, this has whatever, nine, eight or nine uh, clues in it. Puzzle two, basically the same thing, only it has two clues in it. So we can test it out with that. Um, okay, so here we go. Here's our board. I'm going to go to File, Open Puzzle. Um, you'll see uh, we have Puzzle 1, Puzzle 2. We'll try Puzzle 2. You'll notice again, because I put that filter on there, all we can use this Open Dialog File dialog box to access are puzzle files. Okay. Click OK. You'll notice that our clues reset, the board reset, and now we are just showing the two clues that we have here. Okay, easy enough. Now, the last thing to tackle <laughs> um, 
is was the hardest thing and it gave me the most heartburn uh when i was doing this uh you know kind of as a test drive but essentially you know right the way this is right now you can't i guess there's only two so you can tell which one's across and which one's down but we need to get the little one to show up in the corner here we need to get the little two to show up in the corner here like a true crossword puzzle right so that the user knows what clues correspond to what um you know part of the board per se so let's tackle that now now every time um a data grid view is built. Each individual cell fire can fire an event called cell painting. So I'm selecting our data grid view and I'm going into the events and I'm looking for a cell painting event. And what I will see is that it is down here, right? So this occurs whenever a cell gets drawn. So basically what I want to do now is <clears throat> when a cell gets drawn, I want to see if that cell is in our list of identity cells, right? So in this particular case, when a cell that gets drawn at column five, row five gets drawn, I want to be able to tell that it's getting drawn <clears throat> so that I can grab this one from here, this number, and basically put it in the corner of the cell. Now, unfortunately, the, the data grid view that, that's kind of uh, vanilla here with Visual Studio doesn't give you some really robust capabilities to do stuff like this. So what we're going to have to do is kind of get creative. And, and believe me, this took a lot of trial and error on my part um, to make this work. And it doesn't, it's kind of a 95% solution. It's not perfect. And I'll show you why it's not perfect um, once we're done with it. Um, there's one thing that I, I have yet to uh, spend the time to figure out how to fix. Um, and if I ever get around to that, I will uh, certainly post that solution along with the video. But um, you, you'll see when we get there. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new uh, variable called number. And number is where I'm going to store, you know, again, uh, this number, one, two, whatever needs to be written on the cell so that we know that's where we need to start typing for a particular clue. Um, then what we need to be able to do is we need to be able to search our list of identity cells to say, you know what, is uh, the coordinate or is the cell that we're drawing right now on this list? You know, when we draw 3-3, three, three, uh, we're going to bounce it against this list. And if we find it, then we're going to do something. Uh, we're going to get this number and we're going to write it. If we don't find it, then we're just going to ignore it, right? And we're going to keep on going. So the way that we can do that is by using something called LinQ or Link. I don't know how it's actually pronounced. L-I-N-Q is how it's spelled. Um, but basically what we want to say is IDC has a method called any that allows you to use LinQ to select um, the, the items. It, essentially, it works like a for each uh, loop where we're going to loop through every item in that list to do a comparison, OK? So um, basically, um, this is the equivalent of saying, you know, for each item C, uh, it's, not gonna, it's getting a little too smart, item C in list of items. <laughs> Let's try this one more time. Escape. Basically is what we're doing right here. So what we're saying is C is going to uh, serve as each item in our list. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to capture the number from the list. And because this has to be a, 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 a comparison, a Boolean comparison, not a value, we have to compare it to something. We know we don't want... Um, like that um, we know we don't want any uh, empty numbers right so when we get C dot number we're talking about for this particular item we're talking about this value for this particular item we're talking about that value okay and then we're gonna say and oops and uh, C dot X why am I getting case if I see dot any Oh, that's why. Sorry, there's no space here. Gotta, those two have to be close together, right? C dot x. Yeah, there we go. Equals e dot column index, and c dot y equals e dot row index. Then we know we have a match. Okay, and if we have a match, then what that means is we need to do some formatting. And if I could type right, this would be a lot easier. There we go. All right. 
<clears throat> so basically with this piece of code, we're going to loop through, essentially it looks like this. We're going to loop through every item in our list to see if the coordinates of the cell that we're drawing at this moment in time matches something that we have in our list. If, if it does, then we're going to be good and we're going to capture whatever the number is um, from our list in the variable number that we have here. Okay. Next, we're going to break out the graphics object. So we're going to say rectangle r equals new rectangle and you have to basically pass it four points right we're, we're we're kind of at the graphics level now so e dot cell bounds oops dot x e dot cell bounds dot y e dot cell bounds dot width and e dot cell bounds dot uh, height that's what we want to go with all right. So conceptually, we're basically drawing a rectangle or initializing a rectangle that's going to sit at the same place and location of the cell that's currently being drawn. OK. Um, then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to fill that rectangle. We're going to make it white and because it needs to be white. Um, brushes dot white. And we want to do e dot graphics dot fill rectangle like that. And we need to actually pass it the rectangle as well. Okay. All right. So then the next thing is let's declare a font. We want to make this a little bit smaller than the font that we're already using. So e dot cell style dot font dot font family, and we'll make it seven. So it's a little bit smaller. Um, then we actually have to draw it, right? So e dot draw, oops, e dot graphics dot draw string. And what we're going to draw, the text we're going to draw is whatever we've stored in number, right? So if it's one or two or whatever, right? Um, we have to pass it the font and we have to pass it a brush. So that's uh, we're gonna do brushes dot black, so our text will be black, um, and then we have to pass it the rectangle, right? And then closing the loop on a couple things, we'll say paint content uh, e dot clip bounds. You don't have to understand why this works. Frankly, I don't necessarily understand or have a firm grasp on why this works, um, but I got here with a lot of trial and error. Um, the graphics class and the graphics objects that are available are are to me a little bit of a mystery. Um, but I do know that this will get us there, so we'll roll with this. All right. <clears throat> so now what I expect is uh, when a cell gets painted, every time a cell gets painted, uh, we're going to bounce it up against our list of identity cells. And if it matches, then what we're going to do is we're going to basically do this formatting and, and draw the number there for us. Okay. Um, so let's run this guy and cross our fingers that it works. There we go. So now what you'll see is you get a little two, you get the one, you get the three, right? So this is three across, this is three down, two down, whatever like that. Um, now you'll notice uh, where these have been painted, it kind of deviates a little bit from the way the rest of them look. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the grid color of our data grid view to white, just so it's uniform. Um, I suppose you could do it the other way. We could set, you know, for formatting the cell, we could set it to gray if that, if that, if you prefer that. I kind of like the look where there's no lines between them. So th th these grid colors are all now white, and then you'll notice there's no, you know, there's no seams. You can tell. So if we look at what one down is, let, if you're a Lenny Kravitz fan, um, as I alluded to in the preview, I am love rule, right? Um, three across. Uh, where's three across? Uh, at the other end of a pencil is probably an eraser, right? So on. And if you start typing bad stuff, you're going to get red, right? So you know you got it wrong. Um, yeah, so I think we're going to stop it there. We'll, we'll leave it there. There's obviously a lot of uh, things you could do to make this a lot better. Um, you could put in plenty of, of uh, you know, um, controls that will catch exceptions or issues. You know, if uh, the user gets the puzzle or, you know, whoever builds the puzzle files, if they structure it incorrectly um, and you ran it right now, it would bomb, right? Because we don't have any control in there to say, hey, make sure that the input that we're accepting is valid. Um, so that's obviously a big thing you can do. 
um, where I was talking about where uh, there's an issue that I don't like <clears throat> and why the uh, cell painting method that I implemented is kind of a 95% solution is that you'll notice that when you select a cell, it gets highlighted you know, in cyan. And I think we defined that at some point in one of the previous videos. However, with the cells that we manually paint, these cells, the identity cells, um, when, you, when you select them, it does not highlight them any sort of color. Um, and I haven't spent, I spent a, a little bit of time trying to figure out why that was, but I didn't have any success um, figuring that out. Uh, I, I tried the obvious things, you know, set the cell selection background color, uh, but that doesn't work, I think, because of the way that we've painted it. Um, however, even though you can't tell that it's selected, it is definitely selected, so it still works. You can still click on it and type into it. You can use your arrow keys, whatever, but it just doesn't show that it's selected, unfortunately. So, uh, again, if, if I... Uh, you know, maybe some maybe someone out here who's doing this can figure that out for me and let me know, and I won't have to spend the time trying to research it. But uh, um, like I said, there's probably a lot of different things you can do this to make it better. There's a lot of different ways you could approach this um, on the whole, uh, but this is one way to do it, and uh, it'll get you intimately familiar with, uh, you know, um, data grid views. It'll get you familiar with um, creating your own class or your own object type, data type. Um, it'll get you familiar with um, importing and reading in a, a, a text file. Um, and uh, it'll get you used to using multiple, uh, you know, multiple forms in one window or one application. So lots of things it touches on uh, to stretch you a little bit. Again, this isn't an easy application to build, but uh, uh, with this uh, and the pause button, I feel like you guys can knock this out now. So good luck and uh, take care.